It was a silent night. It was a holy night. In the dark, there came an awesome light. All around the town, the people were sleeping, and out in the fields, the shepherds were keeping away in a manger. A baby lay, a tiny boy, laying in the hay. All the angels shouted loud and clear, Hallelujah, the King is here. Jesus, our Savior, is born today. This baby is here to stay. Yes, we couldn't, we couldn't let that go. So Brandon and Leonard, thank you guys. And Brandon Sr., he's helping him out there. Yeah, they shared that in Kids Church uh, last Sunday, or, and Alicia was telling me, this is awesome. We need, to, we need to put that in the program tonight. So, so thank you, guys. Thank you. So a few weeks, uh, a few weeks before Jesus was born, I'm going to get, get our... Uh, um, Bethlehem, there we go, thank you. A few weeks before Jesus was born, while Mary was still very pregnant, um, a census was called by the Roman emperor, the Roman government, and all the people of Israel had to return to the uh, home or the village where they grew up or where their family was from. Now, Joseph and Mary were living in Nazareth at the time. And since Joseph was of the house and lineage of David, David's town was Bethlehem, so they had to travel all the way to Bethlehem. The distance from Nazareth, which is in the north of Israel, down to Bethlehem, which is more toward the south. Bethlehem is about two or three miles south of Jerusalem. is about 70 or 80 miles. That, that, it's not very far, but 70 or 80 miles on foot or on horseback is a long way, especially if you're pregnant, right? And that's normally about a four-day journey. And because Mary was nine months pregnant, um, most likely she didn't walk all the way, but maybe riding a donkey, and it took a little bit longer to get there. But when they arrived, Joseph found that his small hometown of Bethlehem was busting at the seams with all kinds of people, people that he hadn't seen in years since he had moved up to Nazareth. They must have arrived a little late in the evening because there were no rooms available in people's homes. Because at that time, if you had a spare room, you, always, you were very hospital, hospitable, and any traveler coming through, you might put up for the night. Also, there were no rooms at the end, as we read in Scripture. There was no vacancy anywhere. However, there was one place available, and the Old Testament prophet Micah said this, As for you, watchtower of the flock, stronghold of daughter Zion, the former dominion will be restored to you. Kingship will come to the daughter of Jerusalem. Now, the watchtower of the flock, as mentioned there, uh, in the, in, or tower of the flock, simply, is Migdal Eder in Hebrew. All the shepherds knew this place. It was a specific place, the watchtower of the flock. It was the place where the shepherds brought their pregnant sheep to give birth. All the lambs that were born there were were born in the, the special room on the lower level of the tower. It was a, a, a tower of stone, the tower of the flock. Now Joseph, when he arrives in Bethlehem and there's no room for him, he figures um, nobody will be at the tower of the flock at that time. It would be a private place for Mary to give birth. Now for our purposes this evening, we're going to use this empty um, stable uh, for our nativity scene. Now, all of you, and now it's empty, obviously, so we're going to get people to participate this evening. Now, all of you moms out there know for sure that a cave or a stable or a dirty um, dirt floor inside of a tower of stone is not the place to have a baby. Where Mary and Joseph ended up smelled like sheep. It smelled of straw, musty, dampness, manure, an earthy smell. Not the cleanest place or the nicest place to experience your first labor and your first birth. But our nativity scene up here obviously is very empty, and I'm going to need some help to fill it up as we go along with the story. So the first animal that we need for our nativity scene is the donkey. And somebody has a donkey, oh yes, our, our, our cake, bring, it, bring up our donkey uh, that Mary rode on. And uh, does somebody have our Mary and Joseph who arrived with the donkey? If you have Mary or Joseph, bring them up. 
And we're going to put the donkey right up here. Set him right there. Okay. There you go. Set him up and put Mary inside here. A little bit. There we go. And Joseph, yep, put him over there. Back in there a little bit. Will he fit? Okay, get him there so he'll stand up. We don't want him falling down yet. Get him on the table there. Okay. All right, if we don't knock him, he'll stay up. Okay. So what do you think Joseph and Mary were feeling as they came to this place? What questions were running through their head? Here's what I imagine that Joseph was thinking at the time, or at least maybe even saying out loud to God. What the heck's going on, Lord? There's no room for us. There's no bed to sleep on. There's no jars of water to wash our dirty hands before Mary gives birth. We're going to have our first child in this place? God, why would you send us all the way here and not provide a clean place for the Messiah to be born? It just doesn't make sense to me. That might be what Joseph was thinking. Scripture never tells us anything that Joseph thought. In fact, it never tells us anything that Joseph said. He's kind of the silent partner. But one thing for sure, his actions always spoke louder than any words that he might have said. He took care of his wife, Mary, the best way uh, that he knew how. And he loved Mary. He only wanted the best for her. But this time, there just wasn't anything else that he could do for her. No other place to take her. You know what? A lot of things that happen to us in life don't make sense, do they? A lot of things that we have no control over don't make sense. We expect our lives and circumstances. We have plans. We want them to go this way. And all of a sudden, what we find out they turned out that they went this way, right, in our lives. Um, we make plans, expecting them to turn out awesome. And instead, something completely different happens. That's not so awesome. Our lives get derailed. I was at the hospital yesterday. And I was comforting a wife whose husband had a massive heart attack, and he may be even taking his last breath tonight. Our district superintendent, Alfredo, some of you have met him, some of you know about him, Alfredo Gutierrez, um, he, his sister's house uh, burned down about three days ago, completely burned down. They lost all of their belongings. They barely made it out of the house, uh, and his parents, Alfredo's parents, made, barely made it out of the house. The whole house burned down with everything inside of it. That's not what they had in mind, and I'm sure Joseph and Mary did not even remotely have this kind of place in mind to give birth to their firstborn baby, this miraculous birth. Sometimes what happens to us is not comfortable. It's not easy. It's not convenient. Sometimes it's even a disaster what happens to us. And you know what? That's when it requires us to live by faith. I mean, we must live by faith every day, but especially through those disaster times and inconvenient times and uncomfortable times. Living by faith means trusting God in the middle of the disruptions and the inconveniences and the disasters of life. You have to trust that God is going to work it out, uh, that he hasn't abandoned you, that he's right there in the middle of whatever is happening to you, whatever is not going the way that you had planned, even if it's a tragedy in your life or your family. Now, Mary was definitely having strong labor pains once they kind of got settled in this place. It was her first time giving birth. I know how long it took my own wife to give birth to our firstborn, so I figure it took Mary a little longer. There was no mother there to help her. There were no relatives to assist her. There was no midwife there with her. Who was there? Her husband, Joseph. But what did Joseph know, or any guy know for that matter, about childbirth? So in between... Gasps for air during labor. I'm sure Mary had to give him instructions, probably yell them out to him. And then the moment came, and a baby was born in that simple, earthy stable. Does somebody have the baby Jesus? Oh, here we go. Bring him up. Put him right there. Beautiful. Thank you. Thank you, Brandon.
Mary wrapped the baby in swaddling clothes, the scripture says. Those were strips of cloth wrapped around him to keep him warm and safe. She laid him in the manger. Oh, and she gave him the name that the angel Gabriel had told her to give to him, Yeshua, or Jesus, son of the most high God. Yeshua, or Jesus, means he saves, or God saves. Jesus is our Savior. But our Christmas story doesn't end there just with the birth of the baby Jesus. Our nativity scene needs a few more characters because something extraordinary happens next. And so the scene shifts away from here. And for the moment, we leave Mary and Joseph and the baby Jesus, and we go to the surrounding countryside. There were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. Now, these guys probably had a fire going to not just to keep warm, but also to keep away any wild animals from attacking their sheep. A shepherd, by the way, was just about the lowliest job that there was. It really didn't pay much at all. It was quite a lonely job. It required long hours, exposed you to the elements, the heat, the cold, the wind, the rain out there on the countryside. Sometimes they had to fight off wild animals um, with the wooden rod that they carried as a weapon, it was a lowly, smelly job. All of a sudden, an angel of the Lord appears in the sky above them. You can imagine how shocking that was to them. In fact, such a shock that these macho guys who could fight off lions and tigers and bears, they were terrified. But the angel said to them, do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord, and this will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Suddenly, instead of just this one angel, a whole host of angels appeared in the sky. And they were singing with heavenly voices, glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth peace to whom his favor rests. What an incredible, otherworldly, close encounter of the third kind experience that this was. This was not like any birth announcement that ever was or ever will be. Angelic beings appearing in the night sky and appearing to the lowliest of people, the lowliest jobs, the lowliest men, the shepherds of Bethlehem. What in the world is going on, they're wondering. The shepherds sat there for a few minutes. They were stunned by what they had just heard, what they had just witnessed. Then as they gathered their thoughts and their wits about them, they said to one another, let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they went immediately to the manger. To the manger. Oh, does somebody have a shepherd and some sheep you can bring up? I think we have some sheep, and we have, uh, there's our shepherd. Bring your sheep up. Here, put the shepherd over here. Thank you. Thank you, Gianna. Put some sheep in here. Little guys, there we go. Thanks, Frankie. Thank you. All right, thanks. No more? Okay. Okay. Imagine Mary and Joseph's amazement when the shepherds arrive and they begin to worship the baby. I, I'm sure they wondered, Mary and Joseph were like, who told these guys to come? I mean, we're out here by ourselves in the quiet and all of a sudden these guys show up. How did they find out? Mary and Joseph certainly didn't tell anybody and why do they want to come here and see our baby? And they brought some of their smelly sheep too. By the way, Scripture teaches us that we, all like, we are all like sheep. I don't know if you knew that, but we're all like sheep. We're all a little smelly, a little scraggly looking, a little wild and woolly and easily led astray. And we're all pretty helpless when it comes to defending ourselves against the temptations and the deceptions of our enemy, the devil, who is like a hungry, roaring lion looking for someone to devour. That's how he's described in the scripture. A roaring lion looking for someone to devour. And we're the sheep that he wants to devour. The prophet Isaiah in the Old Testament wrote, We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us 
has turned to our own way. We have all sinned and we've all turned away from God. We have all gone our own way and we've done our own thing and we've ignored God's plan and God's purpose for us. We have gone astray. But this scene that we're building here this evening, this nativity scene with shepherds and sheep gathered around the Christ child, that is an unforgettable scene that captures our hearts, that captures our minds, it captures our attention. We can all come to Jesus. All of us can come and worship him. Everyone is welcome at the manger. Nobody is turned away. No matter how far you've wandered astray, no matter how distant that you feel you are from God, you are welcome here. You can be a part of the worshipers at the nativity scene where God became man and dwelled among us. You are welcome in this church. There is room for each of you. Now, our nativity scene is just about complete. In fact, it is complete according to the scriptures. But for the sake of the full story, kind of the, 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 the complete nativity scene, we're going to add a few more characters. Um, because we are missing some wise men and some camels. So who has, some, who has our, our wise men and our camels? Come on up. We need to set them up here as part of the, the full nativity scene. Come on up here, guys. Bring up those big guys. Okay, thank you. Right there. There's another one. He's bringing his gift. And we need some camels. Okay, but there we go. And that one up front. There we go. Thank you. Thank you, guys. So about one to two years later, as we understand the scriptures, these, these guys from the east arrived at Bethlehem. We, 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 we think there was at least three of them because there were three gifts given to Jesus, but maybe there's many more of them. These guys were considered the wise men of the day. Uh, they were foreigners. They were Gentiles. They were not Jewish. They were magi, it says, or astrologers who watched the events in the sky and the movement of the stars and the planets, and they tried to connect what was happening in the sky with the prophecies. A great star had appeared in the sky, and they had begun to follow it from the east to the west. And it brought them all the way to Bethlehem. Once again, when Mary and Joseph see them, they are totally surprised. They're very perplexed by these unexpected visitors. Why have these guys come to pay us a visit? Whatever prompted them to spend all that time and go to all that expense and all that distance to come and see our baby boy? Strange. First it was the shepherds. Now it's these wise guys from the east. You see, the birth of Jesus is for all kinds of people. From the poorest or the lowliest in society, like the shepherds, all the way up to the most educated and the most knowledgeable, highest status in our society, like the wise men represent. It doesn't matter, by the way, what level of society you are in, what status you hold. It doesn't matter um, how uneducated you are or how smart you are. It doesn't matter what country you were born in or where you live now. It doesn't matter how much money you have or don't have. And it certainly doesn't matter what color of skin you have or ethnic group that you're a part of. Everyone is welcome. People near and people far will hear about Jesus and be drawn to him. The scripture says this. Out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation will come those whose hearts will respond to Jesus the Christ, the Son of God, Jesus the Messiah, the Son of Man, Revelation chapter 5. Now that we see that our nativity scene is, is complete here, and thank you for those of you who, who helped out. Um, has all the people, has all the animals who played a part in the birth of Jesus and the announcement of his birth. Oh, we're missing an angel. Somebody has an angel, I think, yes. Yeah. <laughs> Let's set the angel right up here on top. The angel that announced to the shepherds, thank you. 
I knew there's, yeah, you're wondering when I was going to say that. Thank you. All right. So what do we find here in this wonderful scene? Um, I, I, I see four things, and just really quickly, whoops. Um, I see humility here, right? No place fit for a king, just a stable, the vulnerability the sim- uh, of a helpless baby who, who need the loving care of a mom and a dad to protect him and care for him and nurture him and bring him up. Humility. I see simplicity here. It's a normal birth. Uh, uh, Well, it might be a little bit strange birth in a small, insignificant town. Bethlehem was an insignificant town, really out in the middle of nowhere, south of Jerusalem, out in the countryside. I see inclusivity. It is open to all people who will come. It is inclusive, not exclusive. This is for every tribe and nation and people and language to come. No one is turned away. And I see faith and hope and love and joy, which is represented here by our Advent wreath in each one of the candles. This is a scene that draws you in. This is a scene that invites you and me to be a part of it, to become personally involved in it. Tonight, would you come to Jesus? Would you respond to the message that a Savior was born in Bethlehem, a light of revelation for the Gentiles and for all tribes and nations and peoples around the world and for the glory of the people of Israel? Bring yourself as a gift to Jesus. Let's bow our heads and pray this evening. Worship team's going to come up, and you can get your candles ready. Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you. Jesus, we thank you. We thank Mary and Joseph, where they were willing, despite challenges and confusion and worry and anxiety, Lord, you chose them, and you have chosen us to be here tonight to come as the shepherds did.